Welcome to the Bible Forum. It is 8 o'clock here in Charleston, South Carolina on this August 26, 2018. Uh, I'm Warren Sprouse. You knew that. Uh, you tuned in all as well. We're going to be spending this time together. We're going to be looking at, at life through a biblical lens, trying to solve all the world's problems in, I don't know, two hours or less. Uh, sometimes it's two hours or more. We get carried away sometime. We love having you here live, whether it's here on the Bible Forum website or it is over on the Facebook page. And uh, by faith, I'm trusting that the Facebook page is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, I don't know if it does or it doesn't because I can't get over there and see it. But uh, you probably know whether it's working or not. I've got the, my monitor up in front of me to see if uh, Facebook is doing anything, and it doesn't seem to be. Although, uh, it would appear uh, from other quarters that it actually is working that way. Anyway, we're going to uh, have this time together. You know, uh, we've got a, a new phone number, 843 666 one one five four no jokes eight four three six 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 one one five four love for you to call in uh not right now <laughs> maybe by the we get to the bottom of the hour we've got a little delay here in some cases depending on how far away you are or just exactly where you are it could be a few seconds it could be a minute uh so uh toward the end of this first segment, which is about 20 minutes after 8, uh, when I wind down from the material that I've set aside for this section, uh, I'll start talking to you about the phone and, and you can start calling in then. I'll, I'll give you some time. It'll, it'll work out just fine. The Bible Forum is a ministry of alternatives, biblical counseling, and education. It's a 501c3 nonprofit faith ministry. Uh, if you feel the need or feel the desire or God is prompting you in any way or you just feel sorry for us. Uh, if you want to donate, we would love to see it. Love to have. We have a PayPal account. You can go there. You can write a check. You email me at thebibleforum uh, at gmail.com and I'll give you the address and so forth. Uh, a one-time commitment or, or maybe every month. We've got folks give twice a month. Uh, it's an amazing thing. I will send you a receipt and you get all that worked out. Do you know what's going on in our world today? We, we did find out yesterday late in the evening uh, that Senator John McCain had passed away, uh, 81 years old, uh, brain cancer. A war hero, survived five years as a prisoner of war, four years longer than he had to. Uh, he refused to go home. They found out he was a uh, big shot son and uh, were willing to turn him loose, and he said no. Uh, he gets a honest reputation for being a, uh, a strong-willed, committed, dedicated human being. Served 30 years in Congress, uh, ran twice uh, for President of the United States. Um, we trust that he was ready before the one true God of heaven. Got a YouTube comment uh, this week. Uh, I have never really shared much of that over the years, but uh, here lately I felt like that was part of, of the ministry. You ought to know what's going on. And periodically this kind of thing happens. Uh, I had uh, mentioned several weeks ago uh, a number of things about the contemporary crowd, the charismatic crowd, and some of the crazy stuff that they do. And I mentioned uh, Paula, last names out of my brain. Uh, I think down in Florida, is this the gal that the so-called pastors the church down there? I don't know. Anyway, she was mentioned, uh, and someone picked up on that and said, we need to pray for Paula. Uh, perhaps she started out on the right path. May God have mercy on us all in Jesus Christ's name. Uh, this is a, a sympathetic response. It's a loving response, uh, not 
making fun of it in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I do think that we need to understand life a little better than this writer. Uh, everything is not sugar and spice. Uh, Paula started out on the wrong path. If you look at her story, if you read what was going on in her life and why she made the decisions that she did, uh, she didn't start right. And she has continued to uh, get worse as she's gone along. Uh, here today, she gives no outward indication of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I know nobody else knows my heart. I don't know your heart. Uh, and, and that's a truism. However, people show us their heart by what they do and say. If you th are oriented in a certain way, you are talking about things a certain way, you are behaving in a certain way, all of that is coming from your heart. Not the poem. Uh, from the very seat of your being. And the Bible is very clear by their deeds ye shall know them look at what they do not accidentally occasionally the youthful whatever but over time look at what they're doing if it's godly then you know God is in there and he's pushing if it's not godly it's probably not the same thing just then, uh, here toward the end of the week, we learned that the Trump administration is going to announce in the next few days that it uh, rejects the long-standing Palestinian demand for a right of return for millions of Palestinian refugees and their descendants to Israel. That, according to an Israeli television report just last evening. The United States will announce a policy that from its point of view it's essentially canceling that right of return that's the way they worded it these are Palestinian Arabs who were pushed out as it were maybe they left uh, you know things happen and they got out of town and now they ought to have the right to return uh, the United States is not going to support that Israel doesn't want that that's why they haven't come back uh, we all know, and there's probably, and this is the way it always works, there's some people in there that are really good people. But generally, by and large, the Palestinians are out to get the Israelis. And if they can get Palestinians in there, uh, they will work from within. And common sense says you can't trust that. You just don't know. Recently, uh, ESPN announced that they were not going to broadcast the national anthem on Monday Night Football. They'll, they'll start their programming after the national anthem. Uh, in response to that, uh, Trump's Make America Great Again committee sent an email with a petition on the president's behalf. Others saw the obvious effort to hide the fact that a majority of players may not participate in this unpatriotic effort in order to make a political point. But Rush Limbaugh reminded us this week that until all of this started to happen, television never aired the national anthem until this guy from California stuck his hand up in the air. When people started dissing the flag, that's when ESPN started showing the anthem. I, you know, I know during time, there were times when we saw the anthem, but it wasn't deliberate. It just happened. Maybe the anthem got started late. But the TV program always was scheduled to begin after that. Interesting. Army Chaplain Todd Starnes was recently caught between two worlds. I think I may have mentioned this to you several weeks ago. The military and the Southern Baptist Association, which sponsors Chaplain Starnes, 
got involved in this whole mess. It seems Todd was scheduling a marriage seminar and some homosexuals wanted to participate, transgenders and the like. Chaplain Todd said no. It wasn't something that was oriented toward their particular need and situation. He offered them their own seminar. It would be an entirely different look, a different way of going at it. But because he would not let them join in, the army charged him with dereliction of duty. Well, it's been several weeks and there have been hearings and some other kinds of things going on and uh, the military has backed off. It seems now Chaplain Todd has been cleared of all charges. He mentioned his commitment to the Southern Baptists as part of the reason that he could not acquiesce. Those are his sponsors. Don't remember any mention of his own beliefs or convictions. Odds are they had no bearing on this particular issue. We got an illustration here lately. It's starting to percolate a little bit as to how we throw around phrases and concepts for no reason other than to further our own agenda. Rarely considering what's really at stake. Recently, California lawmakers indicated they wanted the abortion pill, you know, the RU486 pill, made available to women in the public colleges in California, presumably free. The legislators maintained that the ACLU bill would, quote, lift barriers, end of quote, for students who don't have access to and may have trouble traveling to an abortion clinic, uh, something that causes an unnecessary hardship and certainly a delay in them getting their pills. On Planned Parenthood's website, it describes the abortion pill as, quote, kind of like having a really heavy, crampy period, end of quote. Well, Live Action's Lila Rose wrote in a Washington Examiner op-ed this week that none of that's true. The reality, she says, is, of this procedure is truly gruesome. Students who take the abortion pill, she said, will find themselves in communal dormitory bathrooms in labor, expelling their preborn child alone often in severe pain and with heavy bleeding for days with no direct medical supervision on hand. According to the Daily Wire, the abortion pill forces a mimicked miscarriage as the baby is expelled from the mother's womb. As of December 31, 2017, the FDA stated 22 women had been reported to have died in association with the pill since it was approved. In California, lawmakers succeeded in passing this bill. If, I should say, if they succeed, all public campuses in California will be forced to provide students abortion pills. We call it the culture of death. They call it women's liberation. From what? Well, from male tyranny. Teachers and staff at a Florida school have donated some 100 sick days to a fellow history teacher who's undergoing chemotherapy treatment. Robert Goodman is 56 years old. He's on staff at a Florida school. He's been battling cancer for several months and used up all his sick leave. That sick leave all ran out in July of this year. And the problem is he still needs chemotherapy for the colon cancer. Doctors are saying it should run through October. But herein lies the rub. Robert had a decision to make. Should he return to work this term and try to keep going with the treatments? Or should he take time off and try to live without money? Faced with this conundrum, Robert took to Facebook. 
He reached out to his co-workers. Robert's, Robert asked if any of them would donate some of their sick leave to him. Sick leave they may need, but sick leave they could cash in when they retired if they didn't need it. In six days, about 60 teachers and employees responded, giving him a total of 100 sick days from their benefits. This allows him to finish his chemotherapy. And what surprised him was not that folks would do this, but the speed at which all of this happened. He didn't doubt his fellow teachers would help. He said they could have cashed in those days when they retired. Instead, they freely gave them away. Why? Well, according to Robert, he said, teachers always give. It's a profession of giving. But it was extraordinary that so many people were willing to donate those days to me. And when hundreds of people shower you with their love, it's a life-changing experience. God defines love as giving, expecting nothing in return. I'm wondering if it's just me. It's probably you too. American prisoners went on strike this week at Attica Prison. Attica was in the news decades ago. It's upstate New York. They're demanding wide-ranging living reforms, not just in Attica, but in correctional facilities across the country. The protest which was set to begin Tuesday and run through September 9, is meant to, meant to mark the anniversary of the 1971 inmate uprising at Attica, which resulted in the deaths of 33 prisoners and 10 correctional officers. Do you remember that event? I do. Lived in the Northeast. It was news every day. Cameras, the whole bit. It was awful. The prisoners have released a list of 10 demands. They want immediate improvement of prison conditions as well as policies that, quote, recognize the humanity, end of quote, of prisoners. They want an immediate end to what they call prison slavery. Inmates are asked to be paid, com are asking to be paid commensurate rate wages. The rescission of the Prison Litigation Reform Act, which would allow prisoners to adequately voice grievances. They want that back. The rescission of the Truth in Sentencing Act and the Sentencing Reform Act that, so that inmates have a possibility of rehabilitation and parole. They want the immediate end of overcharging, over-sentencing, and parole denials of black inmates. Now, you don't know this, but I'll tell you that the majority of the inmates are black. The inmates want an end to racist gang enhancement laws. No clue what that means, and they didn't explain it. They want immediate end to inmates being denied access to rehabilitation programs at their place of detention because of their labels. Seems that when you're labeled a violent offender, you don't get access to the rehabilitation programs. They want that to stop. Additional rehabilitation programs are being requested in state prisons along with it. They want the reinstatement of Pell Grants in all U.S. states and territories, the restoration of violating rights for, quote, all confined citizens serving prison sentences, pretrial detainees, and so-called ex-felons. Do you hear the terminology? Slavery. Pell Grants. Racist gang enhancement laws overcharging, over-sentencing of black inmates, allowing prisoners to adequately voice grievances, prison slavery, paid commensurate salaries. 
Somebody should get a campaign together and maybe get some people with the placards and walk around the prison with a sign on it and says that says, Attica is a prison. You're here because you have no regard for basic human rights and you have no regard for the law. I know prison reform is touchy, but if you get to Attica, sweetheart, you earned it. Prison labor is a blessing. It's not slavery. It allows prisoners out of their cells to interact with people, to move around, to see something more than the walls of that cell, to get a little money to buy cigarettes or whatever. It's not a career move. We have a political prisoner right now living 24 hours a day in a cell without any reading material, no television, no radio, no internet, and no visitors other than his attorneys and I think maybe his wife. And even then it's limited, significantly limited. His name is Paul Manafort. His crime is being vulnerable as a result of his financial activities. But more than that, his crime is being close to the president, who is the real target. I could end this slavery in five minutes. But if you're in Attica, you've done something. This man is serving the same sentence they are for hardly doing anything. If you think that sitting alone all day, every day, pondering your situation, which is what penitentiaries are about, we don't call them that anymore, it was to do penance. You do nothing. You speak to no one. And if you think that's bad, well, that's prison. You had to earn your place there. And you did. It's a place for you to think about what you've done. It's not a career move. You do know that the people wandering around today who call themselves progressives or liberals are people who hate any government policy that would limit, that is, things that would easily manipulate voters to allow people into this country whether they come legally or not. For them the federal statutes don't really matter. Well now they're upset that ICE is conducting indiscriminate raids and sweeps. Keep in mind we read how the DHS has arrested more than 127,000 immigrants who either had criminal convictions or have pending criminal charges. We're talking about more than 1,800 homicide offenses, 5,000 sexual assault offenses. The organization claims it conducted indiscriminate raids and sweeps saying that the vast majority, 92%, were either fugitives or at least suspected of committing crimes. The problem here? The so-called progressive community says yes. Tom Holman, the ICE director, says no. Because of sanctuary policies that block local cooperation with federal authorities, this agency is forced to conduct at-large arrests, which inevitably result in collateral arrests. He also said, however, that this agency engaged in lawful practices when arresting undocumented immigrants. Americans, trying to make sure there are no requirements for coming into the country. Trying to make sure 
that there are no recriminations for people who may have been criminals when they got here or committed a criminal act in getting in here or have committed criminal acts since. You saw the young lady in Iowa that was killed. He's one of them. Been here for five years, undocumented. We used to call them something else. Never really called them undocumented. Called them wetbacks. We called them criminals. There's a reason for that. A recent Gallup poll revealed that a plurality of Americans view the government, their government, as the number one problem facing the country. Immigration, which was the top concern in July, has now dropped to second place. Government is now the top problem. So Gallup asked Americans to name the most important problem facing the United States today. More than one in five voters, 21%, told pollsters that dissatisfaction with some facet of government or poor leadership was the most important problem the U.S. faces today. Immigration and illegal aliens came in second, 16%. And that's a six-point drop from July when voters said immigration was the leading problem in the country. During that time, stories of the separation of illegal alien parents and children dominated headlines as the Trump administration announced it would fully enforce immigration laws. July has been the only month so far this year that government was not named as the top problem. In fact, voters named government as the top problem during all of 2017 and in 2015. And in 2014, government was number two in 2013 and 2016, trailing the economy both years. In January 2017, the month President Donald Trump was sworn in, 11% of Americans named the government the top problem. Keep in mind, we're, anything under 20% is, it's hard to see that as a major issue. As rancor in Washington, D.C. has increased over the last 19 months, these percentages are increasing, hitting a high of 25% in both June of 2017 and January of 2018. Race relations and racism came in a distant third at 7%, followed by unifying the country, 6%. Tied at 5% were lack of respect for other people, health care, and the economy. 4% ethical, moral decline, and unemployment. All in all, those are low, low numbers. Seems we're trying to stir up a tempest in a teapot. Is it working? Sadly, I think it is. We'll be back. We're going to take a little break. Love for you to call 843-666-1154. And when we come back, we'll talk about religiosity in America. Uh, yeah, you know. We'll see. <laughs> 